nice picture behind me instead of all my stuff. <laughs> All right, I think we can actually start. We're we're pretty close to um to most of the people. So why don't we why don't we start? So I would like to thank all of these wonderful women for joining us today. We have a, a fantastic panel of distillers and winemakers from Brown Foreman. Thank Brown Foreman for being our sponsor for this event today. And these ladies are all going to talk to us about how they pivoted their careers, how they followed their arrow, followed their passion to land them in the roles that they're in now, whether it's a master distiller, a winemaker. Um, it's just, a, you know, a, a fabulous journey that these ladies have taken. So I want to say cheers. I have my, my bottle of Sonoma Cotrera here. <laughs> so, yep. So cheers to the Chardonnay with the Chardonnay that Cara made. And I'm going to um, turn this over to Macaulay. But first, I just want to tell everybody that if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box and I will farm them out to the ladies to discuss any of the, the questions, any of the answers that they may have for you. Um, but that'll just make it easiest to put any of the questions into the chat box and I'll be looking at that. Um, so with that being said, I want to say thank you again to Brown Foreman for sponsoring this wonderful event. And uh, Macaulay, take it away. Okay. Francine, thank you so much. And thank you to Ladown for having us um, today. Um, Francine mentioned, my name is Macaulay Adams. I am our corporate brand manager, so our manager of the Brown Foreman brand. Um, and I am coming at you live from Louisville, Kentucky our headquarters. Um, this picture behind me is not actually where I am. It's a little chilly today. We're having a, quite a cold spring, um, but I am anxious to get outside. Um, but anyway, we're, we're really excited to be here and, and just wanted to say happy Women's History Month to each of you. Um, I know we're wrapping up the month and it's been a very action-packed one for us, um, especially for these three ladies. And I want to thank them for, um, for making time um, especially Rachel, it's 10 o'clock her time. Um, and uh, so it's, it's really, really nice to, to have a chance to um, speak to each of them and, and hear some of your questions. Um, so on behalf of BF, uh, we're honored to join this discussion. Um, it's some of the most important topics in the Drake's community and looking at someone's career path in some cases can be a little overwhelming. Sometimes it actually can be quite inspiring. And I think, um, when we when we hear from each of these three women, you'll you'll be pretty inspired to hear the the things that they've done in their career. Um, and with with us today are Kara Morrison, our mass or our winemaker in uh, Sonoma Cotrera. She makes our um, our Chardonnay. Maybe we should call you the master winemaker. I mean that sounds pretty fancy. Um, but uh, so Kara, yeah, Kara is in Sonoma County. Um, and then we have Lexi Phillips, our assistant distiller at, at Jack Daniel Distillery in Lynchburg. Tennessee. Some of us call it Lynch Vegas. Um, and Dr. Rachel Berry in Edinburgh, Scotland. You want to listen uh, to a seminar on friend. women changing careers? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think you're in the right place. Okay. Anyway, sorry. So, and then Dr. Berry is, uh, is coming, <laughs> is, is here from um, Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, and she is our master blender um, of our Scotch whiskey uh, for Brown Foreman. So what I'll do is um, we're going to, I've got a couple of questions for each, um, each lady and we'll, we'll go through each of them, but um, certainly encourage your questions. Um, Francine, I think is going to field those if we have some that are pertinent to the conversation. Um, at the time, we, we can definitely ch um, let you all chime in and ask those questions. If not, we'll get, we'll get to most of them at the end of uh, the discussion. But again, thank you so much for having us. And um, Kara, if you're ready, we'll, we'll jump right in. Okay. Um, so Kara, do you mind uh, giving us just a, a quick intro on who you are and, and what you do? Uh, so I'm Kara Morrison and I'm a Chardonnay winemaker here at Sonoma Couture Vineyards. I've been here since 2005. Um, I've actually worked at Brown Corman um, since 1998 at other wineries that they used to own. Um, but uh, yeah, I love making the Chardonnay here at Sonoma Couture. Um, I guess that's a brief intro of where I am. <laughs> that's, 
That's perfect. Um, thank you so much. I, I enjoy drinking the um, Chardonnay at Sonero Macatrea, so thank you for making it. Um, so you made quite a, a big a big jump um, into winemaking. You you set out um, as a freshman going into UC Davis, um, thinking you were going to go pre med, become a doctor. And what seems like a logical move to me to go from pre med to winemaking may not have been the most logical at the moment. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what what drew you to winemaking and and why you went away from what you probably thought was going to be your career in medicine? Yeah, well, fortunately, the first couple of years of pre-med and winemaking are all science oriented. So it was the same classes. So I went to a, my biology class had a TA and he was in the, he was actually a grad student in the uh, winemaking program. And I thought, well, never heard of that. I didn't know that was a possibility. And so it's the first quarter of my sophomore year and I went to enter a winemaking course at UC Davis and they talked about malactive fermentation and it was science and art and some winemakers use it to do different things for the style of the wine and um, but then there's also the science and the microbiology of the bacteria and I just thought this is so cool and I just followed the teacher back to her office and asked to change my major that day so it was a it was just kind of a sudden shift and I just fell in love with it I never and I grew up with my dad squeezing the bag to get that last drop out of the Peter Bellum box or whatever. Um, so I had no background. I didn't have any of this fluffy, you know, knowledge about wine. So it was just kind of a jump into it. Um, so yeah, my mom said, I didn't know, I knew you liked to drink, but I know you could major in it. <laughs> <laughs> so I showed her, <laughs> you can do it and you can have a career. So yeah, that's mostly how I fell into the path of winemaking and, um, and then after you know college and, and in college they actually encourage you to take a quarter off or a quarter off to do a wine harvest somewhere, and I did do that, and that was huge um, to really know if you like the career choice because you're going to have to work harvest every year and it's such an intense time. Um, so I actually fell in love with harvest, and that's why I stuck to the path. So yeah, I, I got really lucky. Just having to go to UC, I just happened to be at UC Davis, which is one of the few schools that has a winemaking program. So well, I was thinking about that. I'm like, you know, maybe if you had gone to a different school, um, you may not have uh you may not have found this, but maybe maybe you would have later. Who knows? It's hard to tell, I guess. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rest is rest is history. So it's good. It's good that you went to Davis and it's good that you um, changed your major. We, we have benefited from it. So thank you very much. Um, so what, um, what advice do you have for women who want to get into the wine industry? Maybe some who are coming straight from, you know, high school into college or, or those who are making a career change. Any, any advice you could give anybody? Especially. Yeah, well, there actually, I was one of the rare few at the, that was coming kind of straight out of high school into college and, and going to winemaking. Most people in the program were in their 20s, somewhere in their 20s, even early 30s, and they had worked in hospitality, restaurants, and fell in love with wine, and then went to UC Davis to get their degree. So um, it's actually a path that's pretty common in the wine business, um, that people find it and then they go, oh, that's where I want to pivot and move to. Um, so getting the science background is huge. And of course, just working harvest is um, a big part. You know, the, every harvest we're hiring, we triple our staff, every winery, all, all you ladies out in New York, there's a couple of wineries out. I worked at actually a harvest in Long Island once. Um, so there's plenty of wineries out there to work harvest as well. So that's a great way to even see if that's a career path you want to take. Um, because that's how you, you really find out what the job is. So. Um, how, how many, I mean, are there, how many programs are there? I mean, it seems like UC Davis is kind of the, the gold, the gold standard as far as, as far as this, but I mean, has it grown as the industry um, sort of gone into sort of the educational system and is that starting to grow and becoming more, um, more of an option at, at different schools? Your it's knowledge? Fresno State. You know, mm -hmm. for all the valley fruit, they have a program, um, kind of the Central Valley of California. Um, and, you know, uh, San Luis Obispo and Monterey State, a couple other colleges are trying to create programs. And Sonoma State here in this county has developed a wine business program. 
So if you want to get into the business of wine, um, you, they have a special program just for that. So, you know, there's also a different pathway as well if you aren't into the, the production side, but marketing and sales and, and um, managing a winery. That's great. And where I am, Louisville, Kentucky, we are definitely seeing more whiskey-based um, college programs um, at University of Louisville, University of Kentucky. And I know we've got um, a partnership that Lexi could probably speak to a little bit down at Motley State in Lynchburg. So it just seems, it's just kind of neat. I mean, to think about um, a lot of us who entered college and, and never thought that we would get into this industry, um, mainly because there wasn't like a major in bourbon, major in wine. Um, and it's, exactly. it's becoming a little more, it's becoming a little bit more of a thing. And I mean, it makes me wonder if I, if I would have changed my major had I had that option um, going to school uh, when I did. Um, so uh, t in, in your opinion, I mean, just from what you've seen, do you, would you encourage more women who are interested in kind of the STEM field to get into the wine industry? Do you feel like that there's a, a nice um, commonality oh, yeah. there? Absolutely. You know, like I said, the first couple of years of the classes are of the winemaking program mirror the pre-med program. So, you know, the okay. chemistry, organic chemistry and all that. So it's a STEM related. Um, and we actually have somebody working in a lab right now. They um, kind of did it as for fun at Harvest and they studied nursing and now they're looking at changing their path. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it, but not many people go the straight line. They often kind of go around first before they get there. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've, we've talked about this before. Um, we have this in common. We both work in the same field as our husband. My husband actually works at Brown Foreman too. And I know your husband works for a competitor um, in the wine business. What is, what is that like? Um, any competition at night? Who gets to drink which wine? Do you drink each other's wines? Those kinds of things. How does that work? <laughs> Um, we, we drink each other's wines. So we're very supportive. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> both wineries help pay the, uh, the mortgage on our house, but we're, yeah. we're blessed with both of them. <laughs> um, so we, we share and we, we often share the wine industry is very, I mean, on the sales side, it's very competitive, but in the winemaking side, because nobody can make the wine that I make, they don't have the grapes I have, the winery I have, and same, I can't do what they do because I have the same thing. I don't have their grapes, their, their winemaking. So mm -hmm. um, we're very open and sharing. And, you know, I have a group called Chard Nerds and we get together and we just talk about Chardonnay winemaking and um, all this technical stuff. And we're totally open. So my sister and I, you know, I can just call him or you know, say, hey, I you know, I can bring wine home and say, what do you think of this with some suggestions? And, you know, we can go back and forth. So it's kind of like having a wine consultant for free for either for both of us at home. Yeah. <laughs> and what do your what do your kids think of it? Are they like, oh, I can't wait to follow in the footsteps of my parents or are they um, like don't want to have anything to do with it? Yeah, they they well, so blase to them that their parents are winemakers. So it's sure. not cool at all. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it will be later. <laughs> Everybody here is a winemaker. <laughs> so, sure. no, they're not very interested at this point. Um, yeah, my daughter actually is a, they're both teenagers, and my daughter has actually become quite anti alcohol to be like a rebel. And so, that's a great way for your teenage daughter to rebel. <laughs> Hopefully, she stays that way till her 20s. <laughs> but um, it would be great to, to share it more with them. But, um, it, I've, I've heard a lot of winemakers say that their kids kind of, you know, ignored it until they're maybe in their 20s. And then they're like, oh, wait, that, that actually would be a cool career. And they kind of come back. So even the um, head winemaker here, his daughter went to school for something else entirely. And then she started working harvest just because she knew she could. And then mm -hmm. she's now going back and getting her degree in winemaking. So <laughs> cool. That's very neat. Well, very cool. Um, so when you think about your career, I mean, you said you've, you've been working with Brown Foreman uh, since 1998. Um, you've been working on Sonoma Petraire since 2005. When you think about your career and all the things you've accomplished, do you have, uh, do you have an accomplishment that you're the most proud of? Um, well, you know, there's, there's always a few, right? Um, I think one of them is really just the consistency and really learning the Sonoma Petrarch style and keeping that consistency of style year after year. Every vintage, it's 
different. Yeah, the weather's different. The it was a lovely party. Try to make it was sure. a lovely party. <laughs> to make sure that the grapes um, and the wine is consistent year after year is really, really um, a great achievement. So that, and then of course, just we had different interns and, and people working every year and just seeing them kind of grow and blossom into their careers. And to see them 10, 15 years later, it's like watching your kids grow up and see them become winemakers and from the internship level. And that's just, that's always kind of gives you warm fuzzies too. <laughs> Absolutely. I can imagine that that would, um, especially if they, they come to you, you get to kind of show them the ropes and then to see them uh, progress. That's, that is pretty wonderful. Um, now that, that, COVID restrictions seem to be loosening a bit. Um, you know, are you, are you starting to see more people come to the um, winery and, and do you have much interaction? Do you have a chance to, to um, teach consumers about uh, Sonoma Couture at the, at the vineyard? We are opening up more. That's more of a hospitality function. Now, so I'm kind of in the back of the, the house making the wine. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we do have, you know, do some distributor tours. We've done a couple of those, um, but and then we're slowly opening up. They haven't fully rehired tasting room staff and kind of got that. Uh, but I, I think they're just always afraid they're going to kind of do that, and then another wave is going to come. So, yeah. So, but we are opening up, and it's good to see. If so far, whatever they've opened up, our appointments are booked, and um, we, they've been quite busy. So. Oh, that's great. Um. I guess the last question I have for you is um, if there was anybody in the in the wine industry and, and particularly if, if if this person was a woman that you've looked up to, how are you impacted by uh, by her guidance and how has that sort of impacted your your role as winemaker at, at uh, Sonoma Couture? Ooh. Well, I've had some really great mentors. Um, and pretty much, I mean, all of them have them been men because that's just what that's who's there. <laughs> sure. um, so that I've had some great mentors that way, they're incredibly supportive. Um, but then also just our group, you know, the Pinot winemaker, Zita Nelly, Archina De Kono, and her and I get along really well and work together. And we go for walks a couple of days a week and always share stories and encourage each other as needed. So um, it's really good to have kind of a partners in crime, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, that you can work with and talk to. <laughs> um, but there's been so many people over the years. It's, and even just sometimes you learn so much from kind of the harvest interns and their questions and what they're interested in, things that they've learned other places, and you start incorporating that or asking them questions. So it's not always just the people you report to, but the people that you, the, the kind of young, fresh eyes are always good to get to. That's awesome. Well, Kara, thank you so much. I um, appreciate you answering our questions. Um, Francine, are there any specific questions for Kara or should we move on to Lexi? We can move on to Lexi. I have one okay. question. Oh, okay. Oh, go for it. I'm, I'm so curious, Kara. Um, it's rare that you hear about a winemaker that's focused on one variety. So can you tell us what led you to become a Chardon nerd? I love that term. Um, <laughs> and, you know, how, how you approach winemaking with Chardonnay. Yeah, it just kind of like everything in my life, it just kind of happened. Um, <laughs> so I, I start my first job at, with Brown Foreman was a white winemaker in Monterey County. And then I was white winemaker at Fetzer. So there's lots of different bridles um, and then I had tasted Sonoma Couture Chardonnay and just fell in love with it. And that's when they were making Chardonnay super oaky and buttery and, and the late nineties. And this was a really fruit forward and, and integrated elegant Chardonnay. And so I, I want to make that wine. So when the opening came up, I applied for it and was really happy to get the job um, and really trying to make that style. And it's, I know just making one varietal sounds like it wouldn't be as interesting, but we definitely keep it interesting um, here. And so I, I like, I'm a very focused person, very organized. So actually having one bridle and wipes is so much cleaner. I don't have the stains on my teeth. Um, <laughs> it kind of suits me really well and my dentist. But um, <laughs> so, 
So I don't know if that answers the question, but there's always so much to learn. Chardonnay, you can, you know, there's different barrels that I try. I've experimented with barrels and yeast and, and um, different malactive bacteria. So there's always new things to learn and ways to improve. So yeah, I would keep it, keep it interesting. That's cool. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Okay. Thank you for the question. Any other um, questions? Yeah. Okay. So I think yeah, I, have a, I have a question actually. This is Michael Ann. And uh, so anything new that you want to share with us that's coming out this year from last harvest? Or can you give us some little tips on something that might be exciting for coming forward? Ooh. <laughs> Well, we've been playing around with, um, well, we've been doing wine and keg for since 2014 um, and kind of expand, we're actually expanding that to the New York market this last year. Um, and so the wine and kegs is becoming more and more, you know, sustainability and, yeah. and all of that. And we're playing around with wine and cans. Um, mm -hmm. So that's also exciting. You know, it's still a lot to learn there, a lot that's, it's, you know, aluminum cans are not glass and they re they just act so different than glass. Um, so we're still How learning there about alternative packaging. That's where we want to go. How do you feel about the alternative, alternative packaging movement? You know, with either Tetra Pak um, or, oh. or cans or... We're pretty, uh, I mean, we were one of the first people to use screw caps back, you know, for a big part of our wines back in 2007. We started playing around with them in 99. So um, I think all that stuff's pretty cool. Again, it's all like in the infant stages and, you know, there's just so much to, to learn there, but I think it's all great ideas. I mean, just like, you know, the, the, the wine and keg. I like that because it's stainless steel, like the Tetra Pak and the cans, there's kind of different materials. You got to learn a lot about them to make sure they react well with your wine. But. Great. All right. So why don't, why don't you, um, Move on to Lexi would be next. Okay, perfect. Thank you all for the questions. And Kara, thank you for answering them. Appreciate it. All right, Lexi, you're in the hot seat. Um, so Lexi, if you don't mind, will you give us just a quick introduction on who you are and, and what, what you get to do every day? Yes, yeah, so again, my name's Lexi. I'm the assistant distiller here at the Jack Daniel Distillery. You're in my office here in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Um, so my day to day kind of changes around a little bit. Um, you know, we do have whiskey tastings to see which whiskeys get to graduate to our single barrel program or barrel selections. If somebody comes here to buy a whole barrel, um, we've got a lot of work going around innovation of the liquids that are going into the uh, bottle. Um, so there's definitely some exciting things enough to that my day to day changes a lot. Turns out there's a lot more emails than I ever thought I'd face. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm definitely spending a good time in my office. And I'm, if I'm not anywhere in those places, I'm more than likely at the steel house. So that's a big chunk of my time as well, just helping out over there. Well, awesome. Well, first of all, congrats on becoming our first female assistant distiller at Jack Daniel about time. Um, pretty great. Uh, certainly glad, uh, certainly glad that it's you. Um, what is, what has it been like um, getting, getting to, to reach that, um, uh, that title? And, and, you know, you talked a little bit about your day-to-day, -day, but what, what is it like to, to be the assistant distiller, to work with Chris and, and to work on this iconic brand every day? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's truly been an honor to come into this role uh, since I've been a distiller here since 2014 and, you know, worked with the company since 2013. So, I mean, you know, back then it's, I never really saw how I could get to where I am today just because, I mean, I've, I've grown up around this town my whole life. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, Jimmy Bedford, Jeff Arnett, now Chris Fletcher, and there's no real way to kind of train to be a, a assistant distiller here. So I think my time at the steel house, you know, truly primed me um, for being in this role for all the crazy questions that you get, which I love that part of it because uh, <laughs> the process is by far my favorite part. Um, but yeah, like right after I actually took this role, it was November of 2020 
And, you know, it really hadn't even clicked that I'm the first woman in this role. I mean, we hadn't even put this out to public yet. Um, so we had just announced it internally about two weeks before. And I was at a, um, a show at our local marina. And I had a girl from uh, one of our tour guides from the visitor center. We ran into each other in the women's bathroom of all places, you know, great bonding place. And <laughs> she came up and she hugged me and she said, I'm so proud of you for what you're doing for women here in Lynchburg. And I mean, it still gives me chills to this day. And I mean, that was the first moment that I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is real. You know, I was on cloud nine for just weeks and months, really. <laughs> you know, so to say it's an honor is has truly been an understatement at how much support I've received and getting to do cool things like this with other women in the industry. I mean, it has it has truly just been a dream. It has been awesome. Well, that's awesome. Great. Uh, you know, you never you never know who you're going to meet in the bathroom. So <laughs> exactly. A nice, a nice person who had some really good things to say and uh, you know, good, good story that came from it. Um, so, I mean, much like Kara and, and, you know, part of the reason that we're here today is, you know, you didn't go to college one day thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to head home someday and I'm going to become the assistant distiller for Jack Daniel or even maybe even work at, at Jack. Um, when you, when you started at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State um, in Murfreesboro, for those of you who don't know, I went to school pretty close by. Uh, near Nashville, um, but um, tell us about the fermentation science program, the ag business. Like, what what was it that drew you to MTSU, and and how did how did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, so after uh, let's say after I graduated high school, I actually started at our local community college. We called it uh, MIT, but it's really just Motlow in Tullahoma, not like the real one. Um, and got some general studies out of the way, and really, you know, I was I was in that boat of not really knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I uh, went on to uh, a four-year college, the MTSU, and I went away to college knowing that I still wanted to stay in this area. Really love just the rural environment. Um, you know, there's a lot of ag around here, and I had one of my advisors, um, had said, just follow in something that you absolutely love. And at the time, I did not know what I was going to do with agriculture. Ag business was my actual major. Um, but I knew that would open a lot of doors for me just because, I mean, agriculture runs every part of this world. You know, we, without some form of agriculture, we wouldn't eat, drink, have anything to sleep under. So I knew I had a lot of options. Um, but it was coincidentally in my last semester there, they were just beginning to offer a couple classes um, geared towards the fermentation sciences. And there were two classes offered, the wine appreciation and chemistry in wine. Wine appreciation filled up so quick, I did not get in that one. But uh, chemistry in wine was the next best thing. And that was absolutely amazing just to learn that there's so much more to it. And I know Kara laughs at this when I say it, but there's so much more to it than just some grapes, water, a packet of yeast, and a whole lot of hope it doesn't turn to vinegar. As you can tell, I learned from somewhere way else other than school. So <laughs> learning that yeast is such an integral part of all the spirits that we make, that everybody makes, and that you can actually make it do kind of what you want it to. Um, we actually got to go on a field trip up to Canada. We toured about 22 wineries over the course of about five days. And that was awesome to be able to see the process on such varying scales, you know, from one place that's as big as my tiny office to a place that is it's truly made in a castle. And it was beautiful. But that's really kind of what brought Jack Daniels back to the front of my mind. Because um, growing up around here, you know, you're waiting on an expansion or somebody to retire. But at that point, I was like, you know what, this is something that I'm pretty interested in. So I just kind of wanted to get my foot in the door. And that's really the beginning of what brought me back here. I love it. Um, do you, did you have any, and you know, you're still young in your career. And I know that Every, everybody faces barriers that, at some point in their life, but do you feel like you've experienced any major barriers as a woman in your career and on your career journey? 
So these are kind of crazy, but really they've been mainly self-imposed barriers. You know, I'll say my own anxiety about coming into uh, the still house into a role that's mainly male dominated. That was a hurdle I had to get past because even when I started, um, you know, my grandmother had worked here at the distillery before and she was like, are you sure you want to go work up there with all those men? <laughs> so naturally it was it was very intimidating until I met my teammates. All these guys were so supportive. And, you know, that was really what made all the difference in the world. Because, yeah, it's really hard manual work. But, I mean, having that support and having people that want to teach you how it's done, that made everything change into something that was such a positive um, experience. And, you know, coming into this role, you know, I've had to get used to um, a lot more public speaking. I'm not a public speaker at heart, so that's had, taken a lot of growth. And uh, now this is the, the crazy one, but I'm sure some people can relate. I've had to get used to seeing pictures of myself everywhere. And these are not selfie pictures that you can get just the right angle. It takes a lot of self-love to uh, be able to full, full on accept the chins that are not there in your selfie pictures. <laughs> So uh, really my barriers, I've had, I've had so much support. I've been really been lucky in my journey to where I'm at. And, you know, it's kind of just getting, getting through your own, your own mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay. You, you mentioned it, you know, your grandmother was like, you sure you want to go work, work <laughs> with those men. Now your grandmother worked at Jack. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, your, your husband is there. Your mother-in-law is there. Yeah. You know, everybody's there. Um, what, what is it like to work with, uh, with all your family around? I mean, is that. It's really, I mean, that? it's awesome. Yeah. Even, even my mother-in-law, people normally catch up on that one that my mother-in-law is like the next office over, but yeah. she is, she is truly a ray of sunshine. And I know Macaulay, you can back that up. She is absolutely she is. amazing. Uh, she's our event coordinator and you know she just absolutely rocks the world here um, but working with a lot of family you know it's nice because you know you already have that relationship with people to where if you need to talk about something um, with my cousin who's in quality control you know it's it's a real easy call to make you just call and you talk you're talking to family my husband down in single barrel if they have some samples that me or Chris Fletcher, our master distiller, need to come get, instead of the supervisor down there calling, you know, Josh, he'll call and be like, hey, you need to come down. <laughs> it's like, okay. So it's it's a, a really such a family environment. Even half the people here that are just friends, I mean, it still feels like we're all one big family. Um, and really, because it's not a rare thing at all to have over two dozen family members that's worked here past and present like myself. You know, there's a lot of big families around here and we're kind, we kind of take advantage of that in that family is a great means of quality control. You know, you, when I first started here, I wanted to make not only get a good job here and do well for that, but it's also I wanted to make my great aunt proud who helped me get in the door. You know, my second cousin who's in shipping, I wanted to make him proud and I just really want to continue on to have something to pass down to future generations. Great. Um, you, there's a quote from a video that we put together for our, uh, our Women's History Month. Um, and your quote says something about, if you're not just a little bit scared of your next step, then maybe you need a bigger step. <laughs> and I, I love that line. I think it's great. And it's something that I'll, I'll take as I, I think about my own career. And it's kind of like, you know, you got to break the mold a little bit and do something a little different. Yes. You know, as assistant distiller, relatively new position at Jack, why is it important to have more professionals at this level, especially women? Why why is it important for women to take those those larger steps? You know, I really think the more different perspectives you have at the table, the more able we're going to be able to offer to a wider audience. So, I mean, being a woman in this role is really awesome because they've never had a perspective like mine, really. So that's, mm -hmm. that's exciting, you know, no pressure or anything, but uh, it's, it's really, there's value in differing opinions and that's something, because something beautiful can be born from a combination of new and old ideas. So I think it's, it's taken a little bit of time for me to kind of come into that, 
but I'm so excited to grow on this journey and offer more and more to the ideas that we come up with. Well, that's awesome. Well, Lexi, thank you so much uh, for answering these questions. Um, wanted to see if we had any others um, from the audience. Do you guys have anything you'd like to ask Lexi? Perfect. Well, um, we may get back to you if there are other questions that come up. We certainly can ask, ask Lexi for the end of the hour. But um, now we'll we'll switch gears and and move keep continuing to move east. We'll go across the pond to Dr. Rachel Berry in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, Rachel, so glad you're here. Um, so glad you're still awake. I'm usually starting to nod off a bit about that time. So well done. Um, if you, if you don't mind, just um, you know. Obviously, tell us who you are, how long you've been in the industry, your title, and, and what, what you get to do every day. Okay, well, I'm Rachel Barry, and I've been in the industry for 30 years this year. So I started in 1992, um, but I must admit, I had my first taste of whiskey a lot before, lot before that. <laughs> um, my my, um, my dad, I was born in distilling country, actually very near um, Glendronach Distillery. Um, and my, my parents had been there for, and, and grandparents, etc., for, for generations. But, but I left to go to um, Edinburgh University and studied chemistry, studied medicine first, a bit like Cara, and um, decided it wasn't for me. Um, uh, my nature was, is more creative and more expressive. Um, I worked that out eventually. Um, when I was at, at school, I either wanted to be a concert pianist, a ballerina, or a doctor, and ended up being none of those. Um, so it just shows you where, where your path can take you. Um, when you. When you truly get to know yourself and um, find something that you love to do, um, so yeah, in the past 30 years, I mean, you know, I, I could write a book about it, but I'm not going to bore you tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, started in research as a chemist and, um, and then went into production and was lucky in 2003 to be the first woman to be made a master blender. And then since then, you know, today there's about 50% of us in the Scotch whiskey industry are master blenders um, who are female. You know, it's remarkable today um, to me because, you know, I, I kind of was the first and it, it just blows my mind now <laughs> when I see, you know, um, Generation Z even coming into it, and millennials, etc. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see, you know, such a diverse industry. And, you know, with Scotch whiskey, um, you know, I was born and bred in the selling country, but it is sold in every country of the world. It's arguably the most diverse spirit, and, and that's what I love about it. You know, you never far or the mountains or the valleys. You know, I can be it all within a few minutes. And, you know, for that reason, we have incredible diversity, even distilleries just a few miles apart, you know, from Glendronach deep in the valley, it's robust and full bodied, to um, Ben Rea. Um, up in the northern space side, which is just such a multi-layered, delicate genius. And then to Glen Glasser, which is, you know, where I learned to surf as a child. And, um, you know, it's just like rolling waves of flavor um, by the sea. So you can just imagine the richness of that diversity. And, you know, that's just like the diversity, you know, for me, I often think of whiskey like people, you know, the diversity of people I meet, you know, whether at work or um, as I've traveled the world a few times talking about whiskey too, um, you know, the diversity of people um, as well. So that's pretty much that's it. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's it. We're done. No, um, I think it's, it's so, I love hearing you talk about um, all these different, well, first of all, I just love the idea of surfing in Scotland. I mean, I don't know how to surf at all. I've tried it a few times, but it just sounds chilly, but I'm sure it's invigorating and super fun. And maybe one day I'll, uh, I'll come surfing with you in Scotland. Well, you have to, um, you have to, when so the glass cool. really makes its mark on the world, you know, I mean, it's just yeah. a baby in the world of whiskey and, you know, that's the exciting thing for me Absolutely. throughout my career 
as I've always been like been in at the start, you know, um, you might guess I'm an Aries. <laughs> so I always like looking forwards, you know, what can I do? What can I create being first at things? You know, um, I don't know if anyone believes in these things, but, um, you know, partly explains kind of my nature, I suppose, and um, how I've come to do this um, and explore um, flavour from, you know, from across Scotland and then across the world, because not many people possibly realise that with single malt Scotch whisky, you know, we can uh, mature our whisky in casks from all over the globe. So I'm so lucky to be able to go to Jerez in Spain or Louisville, Kentucky, or I could go to Jamaica for rum barrels, or I could go to Sicily this summer <laughs> as a holiday, but also to get some Marsala casks um, and Australia perhaps to get wine, or of course, Sonoma Kutra, which is the next project on my list. So it's a very, very rich world, um, the world of, of whiskey, taking the very old um, school malt, you know, back to 1826, and then being able to fully embrace the diversity of the world of flavor. You know, it's very, very similar to, to food and the, and the rich cultures of food that you experience um, throughout the world. There is no question you would have been a phenomenal doctor. Great bedside manner. I, I would have taken bad news uh, from, from you um, on my health, but I'm certainly glad that you went in uh, the direction that you did. Um, I think it's it's so wonderful. Um, so 30 years in the industry, uh, first lady female master blender, um, and just recently uh, received um, a new accolade, lifetime achievement from Oren Moore. Did I say that right? Whiskey Awards, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, I mean, this is this is pretty pretty amazing, and, and truthfully, as a Brown Foreman employee, I'm, I'm certainly, certainly happy um, that, that you're, you're on our team, and, and you have done so much with our, with our whiskeys, um, even from former, former brands that we worked on many, many years mm -hmm. ago, um, but, um, you know, as you see more people getting into the industry, and, and even now we have an assistant blender um, in, in Kirsten Ainsley, who um, is learning from you and gets to work with you every day, and I know she loves it. I've talked to her a few times on about it. You know, what advice do you have for women who want to get into the Scotch industry in particular? Yeah, I mean, you've got to follow your passion. Know yourself first and foremost, you know, understand your own nature. You know, I think that's really, really important to start, as a starting point um, to know what sort of things you enjoy doing because there's jobs an incredible number of jobs, you know, throughout the industry. You know, you could be an accountant if you wished. Um, you could be a, a blender like me. You could be an engineer um, fixing the distillery or the bottling lines. Um, you could be in marketing, the most expressive of them all. Um, and sort of knowing yourself and um, having the confidence in you as an individual is really, really important. I can't, you know, um, say that strongly enough. Knowing what you love. So many people. Um, Harry, what university? does degrees it does master's courses and it does it remotely as well probably very similar to the course in louisville but there's a lot of people in the states do the masters at harriet watt too the the masters in brewing and distilling so you could do that if you want to take an, an academic route um obviously if you're in the us you'd have to come across to scotland to maybe do an internship in a distillery or you know find a job here um, or, of course, there are so many sales jobs in the US and um, ambassadors. Um, you know, it's how to obviously translate and interpret the diversity of our 133 distilleries now in Scotland um, to, to an incredible growing audience in the US. I mean, it's a very, very important market for single malt Scotch whiskey and you know, it's very, very similar. Again, a commonality with Cara, you know, I liken single malt Scotch whiskey to, um, to Chateau Wines individual vineyards because they've all got such a distinctive and different character 
that you can explore. So read about it on the web as well. There's so much about distilleries um, at your fingertips now. So, you know, if you're passionate about it, there's, there's just so much to discover and learn and then reach out, you know, um, and be persistent as well. Um, you know, I got my job by chance. I just was um, cycling past the career service at Edinburgh University after I got my degree. And there was a job advertised on the last day um, as a research scientist at the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute. I had no idea this even existed, but it gave me the perfect opportunity to marry my hobby, my passion. I used to buy a miniature, tiny little bottle of every distillery every week to try. Um, and my chemistry knowledge to really try and understand the nature of whiskey. And um, yeah, there's nothing else like it. It's, um, it's uh, been an incredible journey. Um, yeah. You know, if you want to travel, um, you can. And, you know, there is just so much. And we're really just at the start of growth as well. So, um, you know, it's exciting times. And how's it, how has it been, um, you know, 30 years in, a um, long runway to go, uh, lifetime achievement, um, we've decided you're too young for that. But um, so you're also, you're also a mother and you have three boys and you manage three whiskeys. Um, are there similarities between how you manage uh, being a mom of three and a, a whiskey blender of three? <laughs> I think Any, three uh, is my number, you know, the trinity. I, Three is my number. I always wanted three kids. Um, okay. I wouldn't mind a daughter as well, but you know, you <laughs> get what you, you get. Go. I love my three boys. Um, <laughs> but yeah, three and three distilleries. It's just for me gives, you know, it's the richness of diversity of, of discovery. It, it kind of is just the right number that I get the variety. I can explore different parts of my personality. And obviously through my three boys, they're all so different you know every single aspect of them is different so different from the other you know I've got my oldest one is um finance you know might end up being a finance direction whiskey one day possibly he's 24 um my middle one is incredibly into IT and my youngest one wants is is sporty not academic but really really sporty completely different from each other um, in nature and completely different from myself and my husband <laughs> so it's just the nature of diversity is the is the um the uh the common the common theme there um you know every distillery is so different um to start with it's, it's dna almost as different combinations and, and and whatnot and then you know it it turns out you know we just nurture that nature to bring out the best of whatever it's going to be Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's what I love about, you know, working with three it just kind of um, is, is very stimulating, enriching and really kind of enriches the journey. But you can still handle it <laughs> and you can yeah. still you've got enough energy um, and resources. And be. Well, that's wonderful. Well, um, one other question, how in your career if you had to guess, how many casks of whiskey have you tasted over the course of your career? Oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I have been counting. I have been counting. Of course, I've got my books full of notes. Um, no, probably now, uh, probably 170,000 casks, I would say, oh um, over the that's 30 like, years. That high. Okay. Yeah, every cask is different. If you remember, we have, you know, we can fill it virgin oak, first fill, second fill. Um, and because we're not shackled um, in terms of our laws, you know, from um, Scotch Whiskey Association means that we can, use, it must be made of oak, highest yeah. quality, but out with that, we can use, um, you know, the world is our oyster, really. Um, so yeah, every cask has got a little, tiny little microcosm in that brain somewhere. You know, and it cool. just comes out every so often when somebody asks me about a certain cask and I just remember the flavor. So the richness of being able to use your senses like that on mm -hmm. the journey is just, it's like getting to know, you know, somebody and your best friend, you get to know everything about them, you know, where the likes, 
you know, where they like to be, which corner of the warehouse is going to bring out this expressive nature or yeah. is going to bring out the, the soul of the whiskey or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's been That's fascinating. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Very fascinating. Absolutely. Um, well, these, this is great. Um, I think um, we're, we're getting close to the end um, and I wanted to, to open it up if anybody did have any other questions. Um, but thank you so much, Rachel, for, for answering mine. It's always such a pleasure to, to speak to you and to, to hear about everything you're doing. And um, yeah, thank you. My, my pleasure. You. It's just such yeah. a great industry to be in, you know? It is. The world of whiskey is just, it's a wonderful world of whiskey, you know? It and we is. all try and create a harmonious blend of, you know, inspiration. It's, you know, I, I, well, anyway, <laughs> I was going <laughs> to spell out the whiskey word, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I have a question. I had a question too. So right Rachel, ahead. Rachel, speaking about oysters, I do a lot of oyster events. My name is Michael Ann. I'm in New York. Hi, Michael Ann. Hi. 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 And so this luge thing is happening. <laughs> and Oyster luge. Yeah. Oyster luge. Done it. <laughs> is that a thing by you? Is that still a thing? Or is it is it old news? And we're just all getting on with it. It's just, it, The taste is just great. It's so much fun. To pair it is with. fun. Yeah. And it, especially when you combine it with, you know, um, as a, a, quite a peaty whiskey. And obviously it depends on the, on the whiskey. I mean, you know, we've got um, a Glen Glass, a Torfa, which is peaty, but it's just, it's the one that's by the sea. Um, and it's just so, um, what's the word? Luscious and I have fruity. To that down. Yeah, Glen Glass, a to Glen Glass, a Torfa, which means, Glen Glass means water of the valley of life, of, of, of the water of life, oh, valley wow. of the water of life, because glass means water. In Scottish um, and glacé, glacier, etc. So, and and it's really like the it's really like the sea. You know, you can actually the, the crack of sea salt, but incredibly tropical as well, which is very unique. Um, so it works incredibly well in an oyster luge. Okay, well no. noted. I'm going to I'm going to yeah. seek it out, and if we know where to get that in New York, uh, that would be great. <sighs> Nicole, if you know where I can get it, that would be awesome. I can I can work on that. I'll um I'll I'll find out a little bit more about distribution. Um and uh Francine, I can I can yeah. share that with you if that's okay. Great. So I have a, I have a question speaking of water. Um I know how integral water is to the whiskey process. So is water to whiskey like almost like terroir is to wine where water from different places has a different effect on the taste of the whiskey it's not quite like terroir but it is definitely an element i think the landscape is really important and the atmosphere is really important as well so the geography of the place um it's almost terroir, but it's not quite the same um, sort of thing. But yes, water varies a lot um, from Speyside to, you know, Highlands. Glen Glassa, again, has um, what I think, you know, I believe from analysis I've looked at, you know, the highest mineral content of any distillery on mainland Scotland. And it's, you know, incredible. It's right beside the sea and it's got this minerality and, you know, other distilleries have next to no minerality. So, you know, there are, there's things going on there. But then there's also a bit like Cara talking about malolactic fermentation um, with wine, you know, um, with Glen Glass in particular, wooden washbacks right by the sea, you get the influence of the minerality, you know, and it matures by the sea as well. So it's all these elements, literally. Um, so there's a sign of each other. There is a salinity to it. And there's also very rarely, it's like tropical fruit. So, it, you know, you salted tropical fruit somehow brings out even more of the tropical. I don't know if yeah, you ever yeah, tried yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, it's incredible. There's no other whiskey like it. So that's an example of something that is just totally different from any other distillery I've ever encountered. Um, and similarly with Glendronach, um, it's deep down in a valley. Um, beneath rolling hills. So the water from the spring is over, you know, rich, fertile landscape. Um, 
and the atmosphere is um, the maturity, everything is very slow and steady um, being deep down in that valley. And, and it has a very robust, almost earthy character mm. and works extremely well in sherry casks. So there is something there, definitely, but it's a lot more than just the water. It's the, the fermentation, it's the atmosphere, it's, it's the, in the maturation. And, you know, I'm re we're really lucky because, you know, every distillery has warehouses and this doesn't happen for every distillery in Scotland. So we, our warehouses are right beside the distillery. So, you know, maturation in Scotch takes 10, 12, you know, I'm tasting whiskeys up to 50, 60 years old you know, older than me. Um, can you believe it? Um, and there's still some left in the cask, you know, because um, it's so cold here. But it, you can you can see how, you know, it's going to take on sure. elements of the microflora. Okay, we microflora have, um, is a big one. Yeah. We have another question from Valerie. Yeah, I mean, um, I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I was wondering, I mean, I think historically the whiskey market is it was very female, uh, male predominant, like as a consumer. And I think it's a question for you, Rachel and Mixi as well, is as a female, you know, part of the, you know, the disc release process, like, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to have your insight. I mean, not that now you're making whiskey for women, but I was wondering as a woman being, uh, you know, involved in the, in the process and then also looking at the new consumer, like, you know, if, if there's anything that you talked <laughs> to the guys <laughs> or like, you know, if, if there's anything, you know, you feel it would be interesting to to talk about that aspect. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I'm very lucky, uh, Brown Foreman, that most people trust <laughs> that I kind of know what I'm doing um, after, you know, 30 years. So, um, you know, I'm always discussing ideas with my colleagues, male and female um young and old you know my assistant blender kirsten is young enough to be my daughter my protege and um you know she's bringing new ideas to the table as well which is magnificent you know and there are no barriers you know um now whereas um, many years ago i had quite a few barriers like i'd come up with an idea and i'd be told no you can't do that and i had to keep <laughs> going on and on and on until you know we can make things happen. So I'm just very blessed and very lucky now to, to be able to do experiments to, to do these things and, and really um, explore flavor in a, in a very rich, rich way um, and, and bring it to the world um, in, in, with a different perspective, as, as Lexi has said. But, you know, as much as it being a male female thing, I think there's also a very individual, we're all individuals and, mm. you know, any sort yeah. of bias, personality bias, you know, what's mm. your star sign? <laughs> you know, we're all different. <laughs> I probably bring a little bit of being an Aries, you know, I like to be a bit disruptive. Um, and, um, you know, other people bring a different personality and, you know, you know, it's all part of the the, the diverse nature of what we're doing and diversity in consumers, of course, sure. you know? Yeah. And, and not whiskey's great in a cocktail as well. So, you exactly. know. Exactly. Actually, my, my husband prefers whiskey and cocktails and I prefer it neat. <laughs> I think that's beautiful. Yeah, I'm a neat drinker as well. But yeah, I mean, just talking about some whiskey innovation, because, um, you know, in the last decade to 15 years there's been such a whiskey boom of people being interested in all the different flavors and even different proofs and different grains where it all came from how it's made you know so that's kind of allowed us to be able to try out some different things and you know to Rachel's point I don't think it's always just uh, men versus women you know I've seen a lot of women who prefer more oaky spirits um, instead of just the sweeter side. So I think it comes down to individuality and your own flavor preferences, no matter if you're male or female, but that's made it kind of the fun part as a distiller to be able to offer different uh, processes that can highlight different flavors. So that's, that's really part of the fun part of the whiskey innovation that we're kind of going through right now. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you so and much. in New York, just to add, in New York in particular, you know, if you think about the food scene, my God, you've got the best food scene in the world in New York, you know? You've got such fusions and interesting layers of flavor, you know? There's so much, I think, you know, for a place to experiment in, it's New York, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've, I've always been inspired when I've gone to New York. I remember doing um, an event. I was actually with Brown Foreman back in 2000 and blah, 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 maybe 2004, around about then. It was called Women of High Spirits. And it was mm-hmm. the Women Chefs and Restaurateurs. I don't know if that still exists, the Women Chefs and Restaurateurs. And it was just amazing, amazing. Um, um, just the, the, the diversity of what was being created um in food and and you can do that with whiskey as well so any any other questions ladies no if not um i know it's getting late especially for rachel and i wanted to see if anybody else has another question if not then i would love to say cheers here's to i'm sorry my glass is is just about done i should Wait, hold on. There we go. Okay, can't can't toast with a an empty glass. That's just not a good thing. Um, so I'd, I'd like to say thank you to the four of you, to Macaulay, to Rachel, to Lexi, to Kara, to Brown Foreman for sponsoring this wonderful event and donating to Les Dames de Scaffier. It's a great way to now celebrate the end of Women's Month with these three powerhouse women in these amazing fields. Um, So from us to you ladies, thank you very much. And um, stay in touch and hopefully we'll be able to do some more fun things with you. I I hear everybody's wheels spinning back there, especially Michael Ann and oysters and whiskey and whiskey and whiskey and whiskey, that's on my brain, but um, Chardonnay (laughs) and oysters too, uh, an amazing combination. So um, I think we can do some fun things in the future. And again, here's to you guys. Appreciate it. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Slangeva, as we say in Scotland. Good health, Slangeva. <laughs> All, right. All right. So with that, I'm going to close this up. All right. Thank Bye you all. Y'all. Thank you. Everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. This wine, like after.